G'day everyone, I'm David Reedy, and welcome to my presentation, Who's That? Recognition in Practice. And welcome to the Blue Mountains, west of Sydney. This presentation was developed and recorded on the lands of the Darug and Gundungurra peoples. For tens of thousands of years, they have been the custodians of this place. I pay my respects to their elders, both past and present. Facial recognition has had mixed press over the past few years. It ranges from approval when it's used to unlock your mobile phone to concern when it's used to identify people in the street. It is undoubtedly a powerful tool and one that can add real utility when used judiciously in software. Let me explain where facial recognition fits into my software. I've been working on software for use in care settings, in particular aged care facilities. It's called UCARE. If a facility uses UCARE, it means that staff will be carrying an iOS or Android device with them during their shift. The software is primarily aimed at benefiting residents and their families, but that doesn't mean that we can't also include features to directly assist carers. If a carer is going to be carrying a device, there has to be a way that we can add value to their work. It's an unfortunate fact that the majority of residents in aged care facilities are affected by dementia to varying degrees. In some cases, this leaves a resident unable to identify themselves to a carer. And if the carer doesn't already know a resident's name, it can lead to uncomfortable interactions. This is where our use of facial recognition comes in. It allows a carer to identify a resident if the resident can't identify themselves. Or perhaps they're napping and the carer doesn't want to disturb them. So can we give a carer a way to identify a resident discreetly and from a distance so they can approach with a cheery, good morning, John, because they know his name. Of course we can. Amazon Web Services has recognition. Recognition has many features. It can detect and label objects in both still images and videos. It can detect and recognize text in images and videos. And a new feature added recently means it can identify personal protection equipment and work out if it's being used correctly. In UCARE, we use it to detect faces in an image and to identify who a person is. There are two phases to building our solution. Firstly, a collection needs to be created which contains all the images of the residents. We call these reference images as they're also used as the identification image on a resident's record. The second phase involves capturing the image of an unidentified resident and using recognition to match it with the images in the collection. Let's start with building the collection. So when it comes time to do a reference image, first of all, we select the resident from the list that's available. We tap the record button and we tell it we'd like to take a photograph. We then line the resident up, take the photo, as I said, using the normal camera app. We decide, yep, that's fine, we'll use it. We now make the decision about whether or not this image should be visible to other users. And if it is, um, we can say, no, we don't want to hide it. We go save, and that's the reference image captured. Before I go on, I should point out that any data or images that you see in this presentation are fictional. Residents' names and details were generated stochastically, and all the portraits are either stock photographs or pictures of family and friends who have given permission. We stored the reference images in S3. The folder structure we use has a separate folder for each facility, and that folder holds all the files for that facility. The reference images are stored in the reference image folder. I use this folder structure as it means that the files from different facilities are never mixed together, which provides better security. And because of the way recognition builds collections, it is very simple to ensure that a collection for a facility only contains images relevant to that facility. Let's look at the code that's involved in creating a collection. I'll be using an iOS device for these demonstrations, but the process is similar for an Android-based device or any desktop computer. The mobile code I will be showing is written in Swift. So let's have a look at some of the code. This is the code that provides the user interface on the iPhone. As you can see, it's fairly straightforward. This is all interface code. The only important things are really the take photograph button, which is down here. Tapping on the button simply says that we're going to want to see the capture image view. We do that just above there by toggling it. And we can see a little bit further down. We 
that if we do want to show the capture image view, we simply call that view, which is here. This is even simpler. Basically, capture image view uses the inbuilt functionality to bring up the uh, image picker. And in this case, we simply say we want the image picker to use the camera. And that's pretty much all there is. So that's very simple. The interface to our API is handled by our reference image class, which is one of the models. It's here. As you can see, it looks really awful. That's mainly because I'm not using any third party libraries to upload the data, simply using um, the inbuilt parts of, of iOS. So all of this stuff here really is just setting it up. We pass in the image, we pass in its file name down here. We uh, set all the data up and encode image itself just here. And then basically using the inbuilt URL session, we send it off to the API and pretty much hope for the best. When it returns, it will execute the code that's here. We check for errors, make sure we didn't get anything other than the 200. If the image doesn't get there, uh, we deal with that separately. Let's have a look at the server side code. We have an API called upload reference image. It collects any of the reference images when they're sent up with a little bit of extra data. The part above this basically collects the information, checks that it's a valid connection, and then pulls it apart to give us a photo identifier. That's in this case, the identification number that matches the resident. Photo type, just to make sure it is a reference image. We put that in there just to be sure. And some metadata. The metadata is used to tell us if this is a private image or not. And we'll look at that a little later on. What happens is that we transfer the file to S3 and then down here, we call our routine re-index faces. What this will do is add the newly uploaded image to the current collection. So let's have a look at that. Here's our re-index faces function, it takes a facility code. That's so it knows uh, which collection to add it to. It takes an image name and it takes the ID of the resident, which is something that we're going to use as part of the indexing of the collection. We make the collection name and all our collections are named with the facility code underscore collection. Don't worry for the moment about this rebuild collection. We'll talk about that in a second. First thing we need to do though is just to check if the collection exists. Now, for the very, very first person that goes in there, it won't, for everybody else it will, but that's what we do here. If it doesn't exist, we simply create the collection at this point here. Again, just skip this next bit for a moment. We then point to the image as it is stored in our S3 bucket and call the recognition client with index faces, passing it the name of the collection, uh, default detection attributes, because it says to, the image ID, which will be the resident ID, that's what we will get back when we match against this face. Uh, some other little bits, including the bucket that everything is stored in. Um, we only want to index one face, so it will only add the first face to the system. And the quality filter, there's not a lot of documentation about it, but it says to set it to auto, and who am I to argue? And we just echo the result back. What should have happened at this stage, though, is that this new reference image has been added to the face collection, and we'll be able to match against it when we do the matching. Having a look at that rebuild collection, it's really just here for debugging purposes. What it does is it removes the existing collection, then goes through all of the existing images that are in the bucket and rebuilds the collection. It's really handy for debugging. You, of course, do not want this in place when you're running production code because you can simply add individual images to the collection. You don't need to rebuild it from scratch each time. We take privacy very seriously in UCARE. By using a long and random reference number to identify images, we help protect the privacy of the residents in our system. Even staff who are maintaining the system will not be able to put a name to an image unless they also have query access to the main database. Also, if a mistake is made and the security of the S3 bucket is breached, no identifiable information is lost with the images. These images are used as a residence information page. But as we said, in some cultures, it's inappropriate to display images of a person. We handle this in the application by prefixing the string no show to the file name. When searching for an image to display in the resident record, 
we don't add the string, so the file will not be returned. Instead, a generic image stating that the image is unavailable is returned. There are other ways to mark the fact that an image should not be displayed, but this way has two advantages. We could store the private images separately, but by using this naming system, the image files can be stored in the same folder as unrestricted images, making the regeneration of the collection data much simpler. Also, by tagging the file name, it is obvious to anyone maintaining the system with access to the S3 storage that these files should not be displayed. Let's now look at the fun part of doing all this work, identifying the person in an image. I'll use myself in this demonstration. I've already included a reference image of me in the collection and I've given myself a fake name. When it comes to using the feature to identify a resident, the process is fairly straightforward. Once again, we capture an image of them. Because this is the normal camera app, I can use all the camera features. There's a lot more latitude allowed in this photograph as recognition is pretty good at still matching people. It is important to note though that recognition will only match the largest face in a photo. So preferably a resident would be the only person or at least the most prominent one in the photograph. Once you've got the image, we select identify and the work starts. Once recognition is finished, it reports that in this case, the person is Julian Blair and that it's pretty sure. That means basically that it's got a confidence of better than about 95%. We can check that it got it right by tapping on details and we can see that yes, it did match against my photo that I put in earlier. I would like to point out that I am not 98 years of age though. So that's how the feature is used in practice. Here's the server side code for when we want to recognize a face. Again, the bit above here is collecting the data that has been uploaded and checking that it was an authorized upload. If the result is secure, that means yes, it was a, an authorized upload. We start by making sure that the temporary file exists. When we call this, the image file will have been uploaded and stored in a temporary file, which will disappear automatically when this routine finishes running. So we just check that it exists. We get the data out of the file. We don't do anything more with it in the way of storage because recognition works better if you send it direct data rather than giving it a file to use. You can give it a file to use. It's just recommended the documentation that you just hand it the data. So we do that. We make a new recognition client using our AWS credentials. We then use search faces by image, which is just a matter of passing in the collection, which hopefully contains the match for the image that we're looking for and we pass in the image data as I said in this case in the form of bytes. We should get back some face matches as long as we get back more than zero face matches we can go on we get the image ID of the first match the first match will generally be the best match we get the confidence level and then we simply return then we make up our return data which is the image ID which of course corresponds to the code number for the resident and we append the, the confidence just as a tab delimited string. If there was no match, we return no match. And hopefully we don't ever have to return a failure. We then just send it on its way back to our mobile application. Back on the client application, the identifier is matched to the resident using locally cached data. An overlay with the name of the residence and a phrase expressing the confidence of the match are displayed. The user can then continue to the residence detail page if needed. One of the things that came up in early testing was that presenting the confidence as a number was not very user friendly. So instead, we replace it with a phrase that better expresses confidence. Phrases range from is pretty sure to is not confident. If the confidence is below 80%, UKED doesn't report the identification. These confidence levels may change once there's a wider range of phases in the system. Once we had recognition working, it was pretty clear that it could be used to really enhance some other functions of the software. Sending pictures of a resident and their activities to family members is a key feature of the software, but I had concerns about protecting the privacy of others who may appear in the background of a photograph. Recognition has the ability to detect all the faces in an image, so the image can then be manipulated to blur out the faces of those that shouldn't be there. So let's have a look at using recognition to help keep photographs private. We take a photograph as normal. Decide to use it and then edit for privacy. 
when we do that, the photo is sent off to recognition and it comes back with the faces outlined with little rectangles. To make the image private, in other words, let's assume that the two people on the left aren't meant to be in this photograph, we can simply tap on their faces, they'll be blurred, we can say the editing's completed, and now we have a photograph that we can quite happily send to the relatives of the two people on the right without infringing the privacy of the two people on the left. Here's the mobile code we use to process the image. But as this isn't a Swift UI talk, I'll keep this brief. We set up a crop filter to hold the original image. If all we were going to do was add the boxes, then there's an easier way. But we're going to do more in the next steps. So to add the boxes, we get the final image out of the graphics context and then we just draw each of the rectangles and publish the updated image. Once the image is displayed, the user is able to tap on rectangles to blur or unblur the face, as we saw earlier. From the tap location, we can find the rectangle that contains the tap point and toggle the show status. Implementing the blurring is done by blurring the entire image. Then masking the blur with rectangles corresponding to the outlines we got earlier. Rather than using the exact outlines, we expand them by about 35%. As recognition returns closely cropped coordinates and blurring just that amount looks a bit strange. For instance, you might end up with a person with a blurry face, but perfectly sharp ears. We also feather the edge of the mask to improve the final appearance, avoiding sharp edges. If the user then decides to dispatch the image, we draw it without the rectangles, but with the blurs in space. That way the stored image respects the privacy of those who have been edited out. And we then use facial recognition to dispatch the message to the authorised relatives and friends of the residents who are unblurred in the image. Machine learning is very powerful, but it's also quite complex to learn and set up correctly. Using the features of recognition makes it possible to include really powerful features with much less effort than if we'd started from scratch. But advanced features are just showing off unless they can be put to good use. I want carers, who are often really busy people, to use my application as often as possible. So it's essential that this extra work does not add an extra burden. Using recognition's functions will make a real difference to the quality of communication you care can offer. If you'd like to contact me, those are my details. Um, I hang around on Twitter a bit, so you can get me there, or there's the email and our website.